What's cracking, y'all? You are now watching Boo TV. Appreciate you for stopping in. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, stay notified, and let's get into the topic for today. What's cracking? What's cracking? What's cracking? So last week I put out a video <clears throat> that was uh, more or less responding or referencing a post ESPN put out comparing the 2004 Eastern Conference All Stars to the 2024 Eastern Conference All Stars, and I gave my opinion on the matchups and how I think it might pan out if they played each other in a five-on-five -five game, a serious five-on-five -five game. And I said I'd be back with the uh, Western Conference version of that, and here I am, a little bit longer than I wanted it to be, but I ended up taking a last-minute trip. Long story short, I'm here now. Let's get to it. The 2004 Western Conference All-Stars versus the 2024 Western Conference All-Stars. And just like I did with the East, I will provide... Uh, stats just to give you an idea of each player's performance level uh, during that era of basketball. Um, so take that into context and other things as well. And then after that, you know, uh, I'll compare each of the players at their position and then from a team dynamic. All right. So the 2004 Western Conference All-Stars were... Stevie Francis, Kobe Bryant, Kevin Garnett, Tim Duncan, and Yao Ming. Bear in mind, these are the starters. And for the 2024 Western Conference All-Stars, they are Luka Doncic, Shea, Tildris, Alexander, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, and none other than the reigning Finals MVP and champion, Nikola Jokic. Francis, for that season, averaged a little over 16.5 points per game, 5.5 rebounds per game, and 6 assists per game. Luka Doncic averaged 34 points per game, or averaging 34, rather, 8.8 uh, .8 rebounds and 9.6 assists, damn near a triple-double, all right? Now, Stevie Francis is... A small statured point guard. Stevie Francis would have been an even better version of himself if he played in today's era of basketball, given his style of play, his hyper athleticism, his ball handling, his ability to slash the basket, finish at the rim, dunk, and even shoot the ball, even in the mid range, something that's lost today. All right, Luka Doncic is significantly taller than Stevie Francis, sitting at about six foot seven, heavier, just a bigger body altogether. And Luka Doncic, no, every, nobody would argue, Luka Doncic is easily the better player between him and Stevie Francis. Even if Steve played in today's era and was a better version of himself, I still think he wouldn't be as good as Luka. But I'm not just talking the stats, because obviously the stats really aren't close, but... Luka Doncic holds on to the ball. He's a ball monopolizer. He dominates it. So, obviously, his stats are going to be uh, heavy. And also playing in this era of basketball where statistics are inflated due to how the game has changed to promote offense. And we live in an analytics era, so... That has something to do with it. So I, you got you got to take that into consideration. And even with me taking that into consideration, I still think Luka Doncic is a better player. However, with that being said, while Stevie Francis, there's no way in hell Stevie Francis can guard Luka Doncic. Hell, I haven't really seen anybody that can guard Luka Doncic, to be honest. But at the same time, Luka Doncic can't guard Stevie Francis either. So while Luka is the better player, he wouldn't be able to stop Francis. If Luke was dropping 40 on Stevie, I can promise you Stevie's probably dropping about 35 on Luca. He he wouldn't be able to, to, to stay in front of Stevie Francis to save his life. Just like that, Francis is on a blow-by, toying with him with the ball handling. I think Stevie Francis, if he played in today's era, he could probably... He'd be one of those guys averaging like 22 points per game, you know, eight, nine rebounds, 10 assists in today's era. Easily. No question about that. So like I said, both of these guys wouldn't be able to stay in front of each other. 
So looking at it from that perspective, you can call it a wash, but I'm still going to give the edge to Luka just because he's the better player. But Stevie going to pop off too. Kobe Bryant on that season averaged 24 points per game, 5.5 rebounds per game, 5.1 assists per game. Shea is averaging 31 points per game, 5.6 rebounds per game, 6.6 assists per game. Now, you guys might be wondering, now how the hell, why the hell is Kobe averaging only 24 points per game? This is Kobe being Bryant in his 20s. What's going on? Well, like I said, obviously the era, it's a more defensive era. But this was the year the Lakers acquired Gary Payton and Karl Malone to join him and Shaquille O'Neal. So the ball was in Kobe's hand significantly less than what it has been when he was playing only with Shaquille O'Neal. And also, you have to take in consideration that they were still playing within the triangle offense. So Kobe generally had less scoring opportunities. And also, he was going through his sexual assault trial during that season as well. And that could also have a reason to do with his decreased field goal percentage that season. Shea currently is a MVP candidate as the primary option for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Okay, and actually, I knew Shea's numbers would be better given the information I just shared with you guys. But when I actually looked up the stats, I thought he'd have significantly more rebounds than Kobe, and the, the rebounds are about the same. And I thought he, I thought Shea was averaging like eight assists, but no, only just about six and a half. So, uh, uh, you know, one and a half assists more than Kobe Bryant. So I actually thought the stats were going to be more overwhelmingly in the favor of Shea but they really weren't. Now, given the context, I think Kobe Bryant uh, is hands down the better player. And don't get me wrong, Shea's having a phenomenal season, but uh, like I said, man, the errors are different. Defenses were different. Offenses were different. I take, like I take that into consideration, and Kobe Bryant was still an all-time elite defensive player uh, during that time, really coming into his prime um, if he wasn't already. You know, or probably on on the you know the incline to Prime Hill. I think he probably topped out at his prime in the 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, or 2006, 2007 season, and maybe 2007. So maybe so maybe 2005 to 2008 or 2009 is the peak of Kobe's prime before he started to be on the downhill of his prime. But definitely on both ends of the floor, it's uh, Kobe being Bryant. So advantage Kobe and the Western Conference All Stars. But Shea's phenomenal, don't get me wrong. This is an interesting one. Kevin Garnett and LeBron James. On that season, KG averaged 24 points per game, damn near 14 rebounds per game, and five assists. My Lord. LeBron James is currently averaging 24.8, damn near 25 points per game, roughly seven rebounds, and just about eight assists per game, even at an advanced age in year 21. This was prime Kevin Garnett. This was the season Kevin Garnett won MVP. And many people were calling KG the best player in basketball. Kevin Garnett was also one of the best defensive players in the league as KG uh, was selected to All-NBA first team uh, that year as well. He was elite on both ends of the floor, carrying an honestly not that impressive roster when you look at that Timberwolves roster. I think the next best player was probably Sam Cassell and Latrell Sprewell with Wally Zerbiak, Troy Hudson, Michael Oluwakandi, and I really can't remember anybody else from that from that roster. <laughs> Oh, man. So, yeah, KG was at the peak of his powers. People forget how elite and how great Kevin Garnett was, man. He was a monster. All right? LeBron James, who is playing phenomenally at an advanced age, 21 years in the NBA now. Before we know it, this guy will be 40 years old in a blink of an eye. Still playing at a high caliber. Um, still, in my opinion, a top 10 player in the NBA. Definitely not the player that he's used to be. Definitely not in his prime. But here's the thing. 
this goes to show you that numbers don't mean everything. Like, statistically, LeBron James is putting up numbers or baseline stats anyway that are superior to seasons he's had in the, in the past, you know, inside his prime. But no one would dare say that those versions of LeBron are inferior just because the points, rebounds, and assists are less. That's where you have to watch the game and understand the game to know that the absolute value isn't all in numbers. So while the numbers are good and a testament to his longevity and his ability to stay spry and athletic, uh, keep his body in shape, but also the league is getting smaller and smaller and there's less defense being played and the spacing is what it is. So many times he's the largest guy on the floor. But he's doing what he's supposed to do. He's taking advantage of the environment and of the system. But Brown Goblins, please. You guys have to be honest with yourselves. This version of LeBron James, 2023-2024 LeBron James, is not a better basketball player than 03-04 Kevin Garnett. He just isn't. And I, I can make an argument for both ends of the floor. He's not as good as KG. He's just not. If this was prime LeBron James, of course I'm going LeBron. Miami Heat LeBron James... Second stint with the Cavaliers, LeBron James, I'm going LBJ. But this is prime KG, prime on both ends. An aging but still fantastic LeBron James doesn't play a lick of defense. Advantage Western Conference All-Stars, Kevin Garnett. This is an interesting one. Tim Duncan and Kevin Durant. Duncan on this season averaged 22, 12.4 rebounds, 3.1 assists. KD averaged 28 points per game, or is averaging 28, 6.5 rebounds, 5.5 assists. Uh, again, Tim Duncan, this is prime Tim Duncan, <laughs> or, some, or somewhere in his prime, prime Tim Duncan. An elite player on both ends of the floor, a supreme fundamentalist. Can shoot the mid-range jumper. Has a great touch off the glass. Plays within his system. Fantastic in the post. I mean, it's Tim Duncan. We know who the hell Tim Duncan was. You know what I mean? Tim Duncan, who at the time, during this season, this 3 4 season, was reigning finals MVP. Reigning, defending. Champion, Tim Duncan. Completely unstoppable and a fourth on both ends of the floor. Kevin Durant is currently having an amazing season. Again, another guy in his advanced age holding up pretty damn well. Uh, efficient as ever. <laughs> I swear this guy doesn't miss. I wish he would take more shots and exert his dominance more, but that's not the type of mentality that Kevin Durant has. But KD is a uh, is an absolute monster. But this is not Kevin Durant in his prime, despite his numbers being fantastic. But he's not the defensive player. And he was never a defensive juggernaut at any point in his career. But there's a time there with the, with the, with the Golden State Warriors where he really did improve his defense. And even uh, a little bit there with the Brooklyn Nets that, you know, he was even leading the league. One or one of the league leaders in blocks while he was with the Brooklyn Nets. Now, the blocks aren't the end-all, be-all, but it, it shows some form of defensive effort. Like I said, I'm not saying he's a lockdown defender or anything like that. But obviously, despite the amazing shooting and the fact that KD can score in isolation and dribble the basketball, dribble the basketball can honestly play the one, two, three, four, and in today's NBA, he could play the five as well. He's a seven-foot sniper, uh, you know, He'll pose, definitely pose a challenge for Tim Duncan trying to, uh, you know, guard KD on the perimeter. But at the same time, KD would, wouldn't would be able to do anything, anything with Tim Duncan closer to the basket. Not a damn thing. He's too light in the butt. KD or TD, TD. Tim Duncan's too fundamentally sound. He, he, he couldn't do couldn't do anything with him. Not at all. 
Maybe if this was prime Kevin Durant, he'd have a better chance. But like I said, these guys, he's just older now. We're talking about a prime Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan was the better player, and he would have ate KD alive. And he would have forced him to shoot the jumpers. And though KD has no problem shooting jumpers, uh, Tim Duncan was fairly mobile. Not as mobile as Kevin Garnett, but fairly mobile. And he could do a decent job at staying in front of KD and making a little bit more challenging from him. But it would still be hard for Duncan because of uh, Durant's size and mobility. But he, he could hold his own. Yao Ming and Nikola Jokic, my lord. Yao Ming averaging 17 points per game, 9 rebounds, and 1.5 assists. Nikola Jokic is averaging 26 points per game, 12 rebounds per game, 9 assists per game. Listen, this is a landslide that Yao Ming is nowhere close to the caliber of basketball player that Nikola Jokic is. Like Nikola Jokic has already passed up Yao Ming as a basketball player and, and having a, a better career. I mean, he, he probably did that two years ago before he won a championship, maybe even three years ago. Like, it just, and the funny thing is, like, Yao Ming wasn't even the best center. Yao Ming, the only reason Yao Ming made the All-Star game this year is because they allowed China to start voting in these uh, All-Star ballots. And obviously, given the population of China and having their prized player, Yao Ming, they're all going to vote Yao Ming. But Shaq was definitely the better player. And had you not had the uh, the bias in China voting for their favorite player. And they have a right to vote for their favorite player. And Yao Ming is an all-star caliber player. Absolutely. But I don't think many people would, if they're being honest with yourself, would say Yao Ming was better than Shaq. He just wasn't. He just wasn't. Yeah, Nikola Jokic is going to eat this guy up. Yao Ming had... He, he did. He, his conditioning wasn't even good. Yao Ming couldn't stay on the floor long periods of time before he was exhausted, and he had to go and take a, uh, a seat on the bench to take a break. That was a thing for Yao Ming for practically his entire career. Nikola Jokic would have been dancing circles around this guy. Absolutely. Now, would, the, would Jokic be able to stop Yao Ming? Uh, nah, not necessarily. Yao Ming had a nice game. He had a post game. Uh, he could shoot the mid-range jumper. I, I would say he wasn't the shooter that Nikola Jokic was, but uh, Yao Ming does have a couple inches over Nikola Jokic. So, you know, despite playing great defense on Yao, it was just hard to distort his vision and really get a hand on a basketball when he was shooting a jumper and even sometimes shooting a fadeaway jumper from the block. So, yeah. But... Um, I'm not, I'm not calling Yao Ming a scrub and Yao Ming was probably a bit better defensively than, than Joker was, if I'm going to be honest, but Joker's all around skill and talent level, uh, just takes the cake against Yao Ming. Like I, I haven't seen anybody be able to stop Jokic anyway, given there's not a lot of bigs in today's NBA these days. The only marquee matchup for Nikola Jokic is Joel Embiid. Outside of that, there isn't. Any really elite, elite centers anymore like it used to be. Like, Yao Ming had to deal with more elite centers back in his time of playing basketball or, or bigs in general, but that's it's not the case anymore. So, Joker's pretty much, Joker and Embiid's pretty much running that boat, steering that boat, depending on which guy you like the more, uh, which guy you like the most, excuse me. But yeah, Nikola Jokic, and like I said, I don't really think this one's that that close at all. Not close at all. So I definitely think Kobe, KG, and Timmy uh, take their matchups while Luka and Nikola Jokic take advantage of their matchups. Now, this one would be an interesting five on five. Like I said, this isn't just an all star game five on five. These are two guys or two teams trying to compete, trying to win. And honestly, that's how the the early 2000s teams really played, to be honest, in the All-Star game. Like, it was much more competitive. I'm looking at the Western Conference All-Stars from 2004, and I'm seeing a more complete uh, unit as far as positions go. And they mesh really well, and their size is just stupid. Stupid, 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 stupid. stupid. For the height that they lack with Stevie Francis being six foot three, they make up with it 
for that front line. Oh my God. Kevin Garnett, 6'11. Tim Duncan, 6'11. Yao Ming, 7'6. The rebounding is going to be stupid. The shot blocking is going to be stupid. And all of these guys, for the most part, well, not so much Yao Ming, but KG and Timmy can play the four and the five and switch on almost anything. You might as well say they could play the three, four, and five and switch on almost anything. More so the four and five, but depending on the situation, they wouldn't be a fish out of water uh, playing small forward if they had to. But I prefer KG playing small forward, and that's why he's he actually did play small forward in that situation. But, yeah, interchangeable. Three positions, KG and Timmy. Switch on everything. Not a problem. Not a problem at all. Yao Ming, probably better left serve playing the five position. But if he had to get switched out onto a power forward, wouldn't be a big issue. Probably play a little sag off defense because they might try to pull him out to the uh, a little bit further away from the basket. But like I said, wouldn't be an issue because you have two rim protectors and Kevin Garnett and Tim Duncan to back you up. That front line is nasty. Nasty, nasty, nasty. Good luck dealing with that. Luca, Shea, LeBron, Durant, good luck. That is a lot to handle. And you guys are much lighter in the butt than those three guys that I mentioned that are meeting you at the rim. So that that's going to be interesting. But the Western Conference All-Stars have, I wouldn't say Stevie Francis is a traditional point guard, but as far as size goes, he is. But he's more of a scoring point guard, but he could really pass the ball. And he could do an admirable job if you needed him to be a playmaker. But you can argue that maybe even Kobe Bryant might have been a better playmaker than Stevie Francis was all things considered, even given the fact that, you know, Kobe Bryant generally shot the ball more than he did playmaking. But I've seen Kobe play, and he could playmake at a very high level um, in many facets of the game. So you really have two playmakers there in Stevie Francis and Kobe Bryant. But though not the best passers in the world, Stevie Francis would definitely be a liability on the, uh, on the defensive end, and I could see them trying to exploit uh, Stevie Francis by getting a lot of switch offs, but like I said, you, you got Kobe, Garnett, Tim, and Ming. That that's solid. That is solid, man. That's that's solid. And I've seen Kobe guard LeBron James and do a fantastic job at it. I've seen Kate. I've seen Kobe guard Kevin Durant though. Uh, he didn't have as much success like he did with LeBron James just because of Kevin Durant's length and his ability to shoot the basketball. That was definitely more challenging for Kobe, being that he's given up, what, six inches on KD? I like the size of the 2004 unit. I like the versatility by switching positions. I like the defense. I like the post play. And as far as shooting, they wouldn't be much of a three-point shooting threat. But all that in the mid-range, each and every one of these guys can shoot mid-range jumpers. They, are, If it comes down to isolation, each one of these guys can score at a high level in isolation. But four of these guys prefer getting the ball dumped into them with their back to the basket and going to work physically on the low block. Conservation of energy but also allows for great passing opportunities when you play back to the basket, looking for cutters and things like that. And Stevie Francis would definitely be cutting to the basket, shooting right past Luka Doncic. Now, the 2024 All-Stars, you may have some conflict here. <laughs> you got three guys that need the ball in their hand. And Luca, Shea, and LeBron James. Shea to a lesser degree. But Luca and LeBron James play a very, very redundant and similar play style. These two guys like to dominate the basketball. That's how they play. They are monopolizers. Both of these guys are... Uh, 
a dream, a wonder for people that love analytics. And to some degree, these two guys, Luka and LeBron, really care about their numbers. Now, Nikola Jokic is also uh, a guy that puts up crazy, efficient numbers. But Joker doesn't dominate the basketball, doesn't monopolize it. He's a central hub, and he's quick with his decision-making and just makes the right basketball play. And a lot of times, it's just finding the right the right player at the right time, but he's not holding on to the ball for extended periods of time, you know, trying to get an assist or a point. Nikola Jokic legitimately does not give a damn about his numbers. And the fact that his numbers are great as they are tells you how much of a basketball savant and natural player he is. Yeah, I got to say that about Joker. So it would be interesting seeing how Luka and LeBron – playoff ball when they have to because I feel like it's just going to be a lot of standing around while I know the, the 2004 all-stars there's going to be a lot of a lot of movement a lot of screens a lot of down picks things like that so I'm just saying Shay to a lesser degree but Shay Shay's better off ball than Luca and LeBron James I'll say that but generally he has the ball in his hand not as much as those two guys Kevin Durant and Joker, I feel like, are going to be the shining stars for these guys. KD and Joker can mesh with anybody you put around them. And they're not going to demand the basketball, because they don't need to. They're extremely efficient. They're extremely accurate. Uh, they play really well within a, within a team concept. And despite being as great as they are, and they have every reason to demand the basketball, they can go get it with limited touches. So that's that's the biggest thing the 2024 All-Stars have going for them, I think, is Durant and Joker's uh, easeability. I really do. I don't even know if that's a word. I think it is. Maybe I didn't use it right if it is. Now, the 2024 All-Stars, they're just going to get eight up while, while, they're, while they're on the defense end on that front line. Uh, it's, just, it's just too much size. But... Their jump shot is going to have to be clicking for them to stand a chance. LeBron James, jumper is going to have to be on. I expect KD's to be on, but there will be a hand in his face from a six foot eleven guy. And Joker, I, I have no problem with him. He, he's he, he's pretty good, and he's much more mobile than Yao Ming, so he'll be able to blow past him. But as long as the KG or Timmy rotate over. Uh, he'll be met with some opposition. But big thing is LeBron's going to be after hitting his jumper. Because even though LeBron James is fantastic at slashing to the basket and finishing, this version of him isn't quite as athletic, doesn't get quite as high, isn't quite as explosive, quite as spry. Uh, it's going to be a lot harder for him to finish at the basket when you have uh, three three defensive studs sitting there more so with KG and Timmy, but waiting for you at the basket to uh, contest your shot. So I think LeBron's jumper is going to have to be going because he's not going to have as much success as we've seen him have in this small NBA when he's really met with little opposition at the rim. It's going to be physical. It's going to be physical, and we know Luka Doncic and uh, Kevin Durant don't always like that physicality sometimes. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And I love both of these guys. I just I just don't think Luka and LeBron are going to offer a whole lot when they don't have the ball in their hand. More so Luka. I know LeBron, there's, there's at least a, a chance that he's going to slash to the basket, try to get a quick catch and finish at the rim. But I, I, Luka really ain't doing that so much. So I, I think they're losing something on offense by having both of these guys on the on the floor when they don't do a whole lot off the ball. LeBron's gotten a bit better at it. Uh, I'll say that. And to me, Shea's just kind of floating in the wind because I just think it's going to... It's just going to be hard for Shea to be Shea when you got these two guys hold, holding the ball so damn much. And, you know, Kevin Durant going to have to get his based off his accuracy alone. And, you know, all the things that Joker could do, you you want to push the ball into the paint and let him create as well. So I, I just don't know with all these. You got you got three elite playmakers. 
or or passers and Luca, LeBron, and Joker, and uh, that's just, that's. I think Shea is just gonna have to be off ball, and at some time scoring in isolation, but that's gonna be hard for him to do when Kobe Bryant is hounding him like a dog. Um, but I think he's gonna be relegated to more catch and shoot opportunities than actual isolation situations. I don't know. Uh, you you could try to slice and dice this up as many ways as you want, but I I just think this is advantage. Western Conference All-Stars, I think they're taking this. You got more guys in their prime, more of these guys, um, and just too much versatility, too much defense, too much height. Western Conference All-Stars, 2004. Sorry, folks. Let me know what you think about it. Am I off the mark? Where do you agree? Where do you disagree? I would love to hear your opinion. You rocking with the 04 squad or the 2024 squad? Let me know in the comment section. I appreciate each and every one of you for stepping in. And I will catch you on the next one. We out, baby.